Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning fellowship. Today we're going to look at the greatest secret in the world. Most people have never heard of it. They don't know anything about it. And yet here it is in black and white. And so I'm going to reveal you the, the greatest secret in the world. And I'm going to share screen. So go to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to begin there. In Ephesians chapter 2, last week, we were looking at our be us being the masterpiece of God. Of all the things that God created, the born-again believer is his greatest masterpiece. And it says, because of all of this, in Ephesians 2.18... For through him, we both, and he's talking about Jew and Gentile. We are, well, look at verse 16. It says that he might reconcile both unto God, Jew and Gentile alike. We're all in the same boat in this day and age. You're either born again or you're not. So he wanted to reconcile both Jew and Gentile alike into one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that are not. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Remember, in the Old Testament, the, the Gentiles had the court of the Gentiles. They weren't even allowed to go into the temple, had to stay outside. And then in the temple itself, where the Jews could go, only the high, high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and that was only one day a year. So now everybody has access to the Holy of Holies. That's big. Have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the, in the Lord, in whom ye also, that ye is plural, all of us together are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. When you go, now we go over to Ephesians 3. This chapter is called in the theological world, the apex of the Bible. Everything hinges on this chapter. Everything before it builds up to it. This is the climax. And then the rest of it is finishing out the story. It was all designed for this. For this cause, see what I mean? This is the reason. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, and prisoner is not what we think of being thrown in jail. We'll just look at the Greek word real quick here. It's bound in bonds, a captive or a prisoner. It could be that way, but bound is the proper word here. I took an oath 43 years ago, so I am bound to that oath. And I've endeavored to do my best, which is to teach the word of God for the last 43 years. Well, this will be 44 in August. So for this reason, I, Paul, am bound. I'm, I've, made a, I've made a covenant with um, of Jesus Christ for you who? Gentiles. So who is this written to? This is written directly to the Gentiles because if Ephesus was a Gentile city. There might be some Jews there, but the vast bulk of the believers there were previously um, Gentiles. 
if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you. Dispensation is a big word with a big meaning. It's oikonomia, the management of a household or of household affairs. Office of a manager, overseer, or stewardship, administration, or dispensation. Right now, just to give you an idea that we can relate to, right now we're in the middle of a campaign to choose a new president of the United States of America. So the previous administration to this one, or dispensation, was called the Trump administration. Certain way of doing things with a certain leader. Now we're under the Biden administration or dispensation. Dispensation, administration, same thing. It's the way things are done during a certain period of time. And then after this election, regardless if the incumbent wins, it's going to be a new administration for another four years. So, we're talking about the dispensation or time frame of the grace of God. If you've heard of the dis, this, this administration of the grace of God, which is given to who? Me. That's why people miss this is because 90% of all Christians Focus on the Gospels. Now, not to dis uh, disparage the Gospels, we need to know that so we know we we so we can have that mind of Christ. We know that we have to know how He did His ministry and what He accomplished. But His ministry and His death and resurrection opened a new administration of how things work. Because things are available now that were not available until Pentecost, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Follow me? So the administrations of how God works with his people are very simple. There's seven of them. They don't overlap. They don't intermix. There's, there's um, pretty steadfast. Number one was the Garden of Eden. We don't know how long that period of time was, but we do know that it stopped abruptly. Then there's another administration that's sometimes called the Patriarch Administration because there was no written law. Then you have the Law Administration, which would be when God gave the written law to Moses. So we have a new way of doing things now. It's not verbal communication about the ways of God. Now it's in writing, so it doesn't change. And he wrote it originally with his own finger, fig figuratively, in stone. So it's set in stone, so it'll last the test of time. But all of those first three administrations spoke about a coming Messiah. So we have the four Gospels that teach us about the life and the accomplishments of that Messiah. So once he came, all the prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled, and here he is. Well, he died and he rose from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven. So now we're in the fifth administration, which is called by most people the Grace Administration, or the Administration of the Mystery. The important thing about this and this, well, and then after this one, and we know in the book of Thessalonians that there's going to be what a lot of people call the rapture, and or it's the gathering together is the way it's worded in uh, Thessalonians, but Jesus Christ is going to come in the air. He's not going to come back to earth, but he's going to come in the air, blow the trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise, rise first. Those that are alive and remain are going to go up next. And there's going to be 
no more Christians on the face of the earth. But there's still a time period where and that would be the sixth administration, which basically is the book of Revelation. And then we know that the very end administration is when God's going to clean house and we're going to have all eternity to be with God in heaven. So there's your seven administrations and five is grace. So little side note here, the sixth administration doesn't begin until the end of the fifth administration. Follow me? So a lot of people are saying, look at the signs, look at the signs. The end times are here. The end times are here. As long as there's a breathing Christian on the planet, then the sixth administration has not started yet, which is talked about in the book of Revelation. So yes, yes, there's a bunch of bad things. There's wars and rumors of wars and all these other things, but it's not this time frame. So that should alleviate a lot of people's worries and frets. Um, as long as there's a um, living, breathing, spirit-filled Christian, there's always the opportunity for a miracle. So, but anyway, if you've heard about the administration of the grace of God, grace administration, I'm not making it up, which is given to who? Paul. Wasn't given to Jesus. Wasn't given to Peter. It was given to Paul. Now, we're not going to get into that story, but you can see it in the book of Acts. But it was given to given to the Apostle Paul. To you, word, how that by revelation. Paul didn't make this up. He didn't sit down and decide this is how I'm going to preach Jesus Christ. He had direct revelation from God himself, it says, how that by revelation he, God, made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, this was be, would be um, Romans and Corinthians about the mystery. We know in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that if Satan would have known what this mystery was, he never would have allowed Jesus Christ to be crucified. That's how big it is. Which in verse 5, well, excuse me, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And the mystery is something that's been hidden. And here's how long it's been hidden. Verse 5 says, which in other ages, we just showed you the, the progression of the dispensation in the ages of mankind, starting with Adam, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. So if it was not made known in any other age or any other time in the history of mankind, in the history of the world, could anybody before Paul have known it? No. It's all important, but this is what it built up to. which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This did not come from the mind of man. A human being did not come up with this idea. It was by direct revelation from the Creator God. And here's the big kahuna of the mystery. Ephesians 3, 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers 
of this promise in Christ by the gospel. This is absolutely huge. Because if you know anything about the Old Testament, it was Jew or not. The Gentiles were not welcome. They were tolerated, but they did not partake in the blessings of the temple. They had no access to God. And we know that Jesus Christ himself a lady that was a Gentile touched the hem of his garment and he said, you know, why did you do this? You know, I'm not here for the Gentiles. And um, she said, yes, master, I understand that. But even the dogs are allowed to eat the scrap from the master's table. And God and Jesus Christ told her, I'm going to grant you your prayer. Even though she wasn't part of that shows you the seriousness of the Jew-Gentile division. But fellow heirs, this is really important here. A fellow heir is somebody that's in the will. We're not going to get into that big word. A fellow heir or a joint heir, one who obtains something assigned to himself with others, a joint participant. A fellow heir is somebody that has 100% ownership of the inheritance. It's not a 50-50. It's full inheritance. So the Gentiles for the first time in the history of the world, are full participants in the relationship with the Father. This was hidden from the beginning of the world. But the whole promise of Christ is part of it. But this is part of the, the bigness of why this was kept hidden. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a ministry according to the gift of grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Here we see it again that this was not Paul's idea, that God by his grace gave him the power and the authority and the revelation for the information that was never known in the history of mankind. As a side note, the uh, founders of the United States, they spoke about this in turn, um, in terms of if the human mind and all the great philosophers were able to come up with the ministry of Jesus Christ, then God would never have had to written it down. Verse 8, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Here we see again, unsearchable. It's untraceable. It's a mystery. It's always been a mystery that cannot be searched out, that cannot be comprehended. Comprehended. There is no mention of this anywhere in the Bible until it was given to Paul. Hopefully I'm stressing this enough. But who's his ministry to? His ministry is to the Gentiles. If you go back to the book of Acts, you'll see that Peter was given the ministry to the Jews. And um, you have to go read the book of Acts to understand why they had to bring Paul in. But he, he em emphasizes this word grace because before becoming a Christian, the apostle Paul's ministry 
was to seek out the home-based Christian Bible study groups and kill them, arrest them and kill them. And he thought he was doing the will of God. So that's why he's really understands this grace of God. Unto me, who is the least of all the saints. You know, I'm the bottom of the barrel. I'm the lowest of the low. Why me? I don't know, but I got it. And here it is. Unto me, who am, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And this word all is everybody, everybody, race, religion, culture, ethnicity. It covers all of it, not all without distinction, but all without exception. To make all men see, and this word see is see with the understanding where you can, we say in our terminology, oh, now I see. So that's his purpose. What is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ? The beginning of time, this mystery has been hidden from the beginning of time. In God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, people use this word by Jesus Christ to say that Jesus Christ was there in um, Genesis. But let's look at the word and clear it up. Come on, click. There we go. It's a preposition called dia, which is through or by way of through Jesus Christ, not him being present but it was the means of the ground or reason by which something is or is not done by reason of, on account of, because of, or for this reason. This was done on account of Jesus Christ. This was done because of what he represented as that Messiah and what he instituted with his death and resurrection on the day of Pentecost, to the intent that now, 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 right now, we're in this administration right now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. That's what we're called in this day and age, the church, with Christ as the head, To the intent, this is the reason, remember, for this cause, colon, to the intent for this purpose, now, unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is three times where God tells us this was done on account of the intent and the eternal, eternal purpose. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, this is why God did all of this since the beginning of time was for this to happen in his creation. And we get to be part of it. We get to be part of it. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. And this is what I'm talking about with access. We can go into that holy of holies ourselves with boldness. And we can ask God for anything that we want. I had do a teaching called Naked Before the Lord where there's no consciousness of sin, guilt, or shortcoming. Verse 13, wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Don't worry about what's going on with me. I'm doing this for you. I'm okay. 
For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, I bow my knees. Bowing your knee is pledging allegiance. That's what it means. If you look at the um, the old Knights in Shining Armors movies, the knight would kneel before the king and, and the king would use the sword to tap him on the shoulders and then you're pledging your allegiance to that king. So this is the reason that he bows his knee before God is the ministry of this mystery word over the world. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Family. We're family with in heaven would be the angels in earth. The whole family that he would grant you. This word you is in the singular. If it's ye, it's all of us together. And down here in the south, we say all y'all or y'all, you all. But if it says you, it's you as an individual, me as an individual. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Grant, here again, is freely given. There's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to pay it back. There's no interest involved. It's yours. It's freely given. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you all together, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend that we can comprehend, that we can understand fully, look at comprehension here, cata lumbano, is to lay hold of, to lay hold of so as to make one's own, to obtain, attain to, to make one's own, to make oneself appropriate, to seize upon or take advantage or take possession of. Lambano means to receive. Kata means to use. That you can take hold of it and use it, put it to use. That we may be able to comprehend, not only understand with the mind, but take possession of it and put it to use. That we can comprehend with all saints a saint in our day in administration is anybody who has confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus. Remember what I said about uh, bowing the knee? Confess is Lord is the same thing as pledging allegiance like you do the knights in the shining armor thing. You swear allegiance to serve. That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length, and depth, and height. Wait a minute. I thought that the earth was only a three-dimensional entity. Breadth, length, and depth. Or length, depth, and height, and breadth. Anyway, there's four dimensions to life. There's up, down, and sideways, and then everything else. We can understand these spiritual realities that are above and beyond our five senses. So we have stepped into a four-dimensional world instead of just a three-dimensional world where we're limited by our five senses. Isn't that something? If we could just comprehend what it is that God gave us, if we could just understand what God did through Jesus Christ and to know. This word know here is really big, really, really big. It's gnosko. It's to learn to know, to come to know, get a knowledge of, perceive, feel, to make known, to understand. And But I don't know. If you look at this section right here, 
It gives you all these different variations of Gnosko. And we don't um, we don't have this many conjugation of verbs in our language. But this word know is to know that you know that you know that you know. In our vocabulary as Americans with the three-dimensional thing, we have big, bigger, and biggest. We don't have superlative. So the superlative would be big, bigger, biggest, and bigger than that. So this is to know that you know that you know that you know corresponds with the four dimensions of our reality. Isn't that neat? So that you know that you know that you know that you know. Big, bigger, biggest, and bigger than that. That you may know what? The love of Christ. That you can know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It surpasses all human comprehension. Nobody can figure out why these crazy Christians do what they do, why they go out of their way to go and serve people. You know, for no, for no reason whatsoever, just because that's what they do, or we do. But we can know that you know that we know that love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye, that word plural, all of us together, that we might be filled with all the fullness of who? God. It's God in Christ in you, folks. And we are filled with all the fullness of the creator himself. Now unto him. This is where we fall short so many times. And I wanted to teach this today to remind myself of this verse. Because of this great mystery and our comprehension and what we've been given, now, for the first time in the history of mankind, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. World without end, amen. The glory of the church by Christ Jesus. But now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above. This is not three times. It's a multiple of three. And I'm not going to get into all of it, but this word think To perceive with the mind, to understand, to have understanding, to think upon, heed, ponder, or consider. Now unto him that is able to do a multiple of three times all, above all, that we ask or think. This word think is used in the um, ancient writings, the usage of the word to the regular public would be your wildest dreams, your wildest imaginations. What can you think? What can you conceive? God is able to do exceeding abundantly above the only limits is what we ask and what we think according to the power that works in us. Now, if we know this power works in us, then we're Superman. There's nothing we cannot accomplish. There's nothing we cannot do. We're only limits as a Christian in this life, in this earth, is how much we think about who we are, why we're here, 
what Jesus Christ accomplished for us and what we can do with it. And I remember one of my mentors, he said, what could we do if we, could, if we would only think about it? How great can it be? What can we accomplish? We only believed. So with that in mind, I just told you the greatest secret in the world today. And it's still a secret. You go to any church, any pastor, any theologian, any seminary in America, the probability of anybody being able to tell you off the top of their head, what is the mystery? They won't know. Because it's hidden. The adversary doesn't want you to know it. Because if he knew it, if he if he allows us to know it, there's no, there's nothing that can stop us from stopping him from wreaking havoc in our lives. So think bigger than you ever have. Dream bigger than you've ever dreamed. Be bold enough to ask God for his assistance in whatever you can conceive in your mind and go for it. And God will open doors, as he promised, to give you more than you can dream. So don't limit yourself to anything on this life. And remember that you, the whole purpose of Jesus Christ and God is for this hidden mystery, that fellowship and fellow heirs, of God himself would become a reality on his earth. This is as close to the Garden of Eden as we're ever going to come. But our job is to tell other people. And that's pretty much the, the simple part of it. Now that you know it, you're responsible to teach it and share it. God bless. You're the best. And I will see y'all next time.